For a couple of weeks in John 5, and I really was going to move on further in that, in that chapter or in this narrative about the man at the pool of Bethesda, but um, a lot of comments came up over this message, and I had gotten several text messages from people out of state and so on that people were sharing this, and I actually was asked if I could just expand or clarify a little more so it'll take some review and I don't know, we, we probably will finish up next week. But I'm going to say some things. There's so, many, there's so much out there with the Internet. And I'm going to just make a statement right away about two lies that are out there. One of the lies is that all of the miracles died with the apostles, it ended with them, and that God doesn't do that today. Well, we have many examples in this church. I'm an example of a man that was healed as a child. I shouldn't be here. And yet God performed a miracle. And, uh, and of course my wife and many others in here, in this place. Okay, now, um, that's one lie. But the other lie is that there is something wrong with you necessarily if you are not healed. If you are carrying some, something in your life that God always heals on this earth. That is also a lie. There are people that are glorious saints that have been testimonies to the grace of God as they walk through difficulty. You don't tell God what he has to do. God is not in my box. God will use and bring glory from any situation. And we've got saints down through the ages that have been a testimony to me. God didn't choose to touch their physical body, but they became testimonies and their hearts and their souls were on fire for God. And they went out. My dad was actually, back in the old days, you'd say faith healer. Well, really, Jesus is the healer, and my dad had the faith. And he would go around on the streets. He literally was a street preacher, didn't have a church. He had those horns on top of the car, and he would drive around and get into the town squares. That's when they would let you go to the town squares. You know, now you need a permit for everything. We can't even knock on doors here without that. And so my dad, my dad was saved, had no education, sixth grade, and he began to go out there and preach the gospel, and he would lay hands on people, and there were many, many miracles. But my dad, he got ill late in life. Like, he was really in great health, and then about at 88 or so, he got ill. But he just kept saying, Glory to God. He was going to give glory to God. Okay, so there, there are people that are testimonies to the grace of God. I've mentioned to you folks about Johnny Erickson. You know her. I know I've mentioned before. Yeah. An unbelievable minister of the gospel. God, God did not intervene to heal. Now I'm going to tell you another thing that I think is a, a lie. It's my opinion anyway. God does not cause sickness. God does not bring sickness. It has not come from God. There are many examples in the Bible where God has allowed things to take place for his purposes, but he doesn't cause it. Quite the opposite. God will take whatever garbage the enemy throws at you and he'll turn it into gold. That's what he does. So God takes situations. There's a story in the Bible about Joseph. And Joseph went through persecution by his brothers and everywhere else along the line. But God was with him. And Joseph's brothers sold him out into slavery. God didn't cause the evil, but he turned it into good. And that's what he can do in your life. Don't look back on your past. We started on this last week. Don't look back. In fact, we'll get to that scripture again. Don't look back and be under condemnation for something that's in your rearview mirror. God will take the worst situations in your life and turn them into good. That's what he does. And you don't have to make up that time. Here's the beauty. You don't have to make up for the lost days. I've had people say to me, you know what? But so many years I wasted. Now, you know, now here I am. I can... God is not on that. It's not a make up the exam kind of thing. When he forgives and forgets, you start new. And that's what these lives are about for Kevin and Jimmy and David and Jerry today that we lit the light for. Okay, so I'm going to read verses again from John 5. After this, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. There's a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic 
called Bethesda Aramaic, means house of mercy. And there it has five colonnades, and within these lay a number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming home, someone, while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. And I won't go any further than there. That's going to be another part of the story. But I will tell you this. This man is healed. And it's on the Sabbath, and there are going to be religious spirits of negative voices talking to him. They're gonna, they're gonna take the try to take the joy out of this healing. And I want you to know when you do something good for God, there will always be those voices around there that will challenge you or question you. Never mind, you just keep on going. Keep on going. Okay. So um, what I want to say is. As though I, I said there were the two lies that God doesn't always intervene, yet many people are walking around ill because this narrative wants to address the miracles that are possible. God may want to intervene in your life. He may want to heal you, even today. And if you limit, if you limit Him with your thinking or your experience, and do not trust him more than any other voice, you could be missing out a real blessing. Yeah. And I will tell you, I, I do have to say this. And we, we must. We must never limit God. Um, but here's the reality. The physical body is the one thing that's temporary about you. It's temporary. I told you before, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he's not with us. He died again. It's appointed unto man, wants to die, and after that, the judgment. So the physical body is not the biggest thing. Paul calls it a tent. My body and your body is going to deteriorate unless Jesus comes first. That's the way it is. In fact, everything in life, in creation, you shed the old to become the new. And you're going to shed this body one of these days because if you know Christ, you're going to get a new one that's far more glorious. Um, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly important to know this, that the most important healing that anyone can ever have is, first of all, to have their spirit, their soul made right with God. Yeah. To know, because... I'm going to tell you, yes, God is about full healing. He wants everything healed, including creation. That's why there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He wants to make everything new in your life. He doesn't want you to walk around with old baggage trying to get through. He's already got you through. At Calvary, you were given every resource you need. Jesus paid everything you need at Calvary. But you have to accept it. You have to apply it to your life. So the most important thing we can ever do, uh, on that one occasion, some of you will remember, I was here today, but some of you will remember, in, in a two-week period, we were called upon to pray for two men. I had never met them. Those men were up in age. Hmm. I'm up in age. Those men were young. They were in their 60s. Um, <laughs> Both of those men had had difficult lives. One dying of just a lot of things, just body destroyed and alcohol. <clears throat> but both of those men, within two weeks of the time of accepting Christ, passed away. Those men had found the best healing there ever was. I have always just said this. I said this to... This person, Jerry, this week, I just have two questions for you. Is Jesus your personal Savior? Do you know that? Because people will say, I believe, I believe, I believe. And I say, the devil believes too, probably more than you do. <laughs> I believe, that's fine. But I will say, is Jesus your personal Savior? 
Do you know him as your Savior and my Lord? When Thomas had doubts, when Thomas had doubts, and Jesus displayed himself to Thomas, Thomas cried out, my Lord and my God. There's a lot of people that are going along thinking they're going to get to heaven on his God and her God, and it's not my God. Being in the church isn't going to heal you. It's Jesus that heals. It's not your associates. There are many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people sitting in church pews today. I've been in the churches. They have absolutely no knowledge of Savior as Lord. They sing the songs, but they it's not my Lord and my God. That's the number one healing. If you're not certain of that, that's what you've got to have. So let's go on <clears throat> from there. In verses 1 through 5, I told you the scene. It looks hopeless. There's people laying all over under these porches. But I also want to apply this differently a little bit. Because around us, all around us, everywhere in this nation, but around us, there are people hopeless today. It's one of the biggest characteristics there is right now. Hopelessness and anger. They're hopeless. They're lying there. When I tried to picture the pool there on the five porches, the colonnades and the pool there of Bethesda, and I tried to see all of those people, and I go, oh my goodness, that would be awful to look at. As people are going by, it says large numbers. They're paralyzed. They're lame. They're blind. They're having to beg to make it. Oh, that's awful. How many of you have driven by a homeless center or a camper you see outside and you just go, your heart just goes. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. That it isn't the pool of Bethesda only back then 2,000 years ago. There's hopelessness all around us. People are lame and they're paralyzed. They're paralyzed here. They're paralyzed here. <laughs> And they need to know hope. And you're the one that's called to tell them. I, I, I just got to dispel another big lie. That it's the pastor's job to get people to Jesus. It is the pastor's job to proclaim the truth. And you get people to Jesus. Amen. With your testimony and your story and your life. That's what happens. Can you imagine if you are sharing your story out there? Like I said, so here's this hopelessness all around. And I told you that the man's reasons, and I, I know this is repetitive, but it's okay, that in one verse, in one verse, he has given five different answers in verse 7. And he says, I have no man, and I, I have to get to the pool, and the water's got to be stirred, and I need an angel, and everybody's in the front of the line and not me. He gives five reasons. Now, if you think your healing is always about your faith, it isn't always true. This man did not display great faith at all. He gave five excuses why he was ill. And he never answered the question, do you want to get well? And I, I told you, it's, there's, it's such an important thing. Listen, he was paralyzed in his reasoning. Most of the healing that needs to take place today is in the mind, folks. You say, how does my life change? It's your mind. I'm going to say it again, metanoia, which is the two words for a turnaround of the mind. Turnaround, metanoia, nous is the mind in the Greek. It is a change of mind. I keep bringing this up. People say, well, I repented and, and accepted Christ. No, wait a minute. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. So you got sorrow and you needed Christ. Repentance is what takes place after you come to Christ. You are going to have a turnaround. But that is of the mind. I gave you some scriptures last week, and that's where I got the most comments, both from the Internet and from people that emailed and texted the mind. Go into that more a little bit, and I will try. Okay? But because here's what happens. I come to you today, and I say, do you want to get well? You don't know how much in, the, in, in my counseling over the years. You don't know my home life. Now, now again, I worked, I worked in the child protection field and children's mental health, and I worked with all families because of that. So you can imagine, well, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know my home life, Sam. I understand that. 
hear me, please. It's like this. Do you want to get well? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know my own life. Do you want to get well? You don't, you don't know the abuse. Do you want to get well? You don't know what my marriage is like. Do you want to get well? You see, Jesus is not insensitive. He is cutting to the core. I love to hear feelings. I want to know what's going on with people. That's important to me. But in this case, this man had been 38 years lying in the same place. And Jesus had a proposition for him. And the time was now. And so Jesus keeps just saying to you this morning, do you want to get well? Do you want to focus on the problem or do you want to focus on the power of God in you? Probably the biggest one is, yes, no one knows what I'm going through could be. God does. Amen. And he stands there today yep. in the form of Jesus Christ with the nail yep. print still in the hand today. Yep. Still there saying, do you want to get well? That's the question. I want you to notice something about Jesus after he says that. And this is kind of a new thing for me. After the man gave him all of the reasons that he couldn't get healed, did you know the most important response that Jesus gave him in this case? I call it a non-response. Do you know what I would be doing in my counseling? You know, psychology classes were fun. You know, it's there's the Rogerian, and then there's Freud, and then there's B.F. Skinner, and there's all these different, and there's Maslow, and all these psychologists. And it's kind of like someone says, I'm really upset today. I hear you saying you're upset. You know, just repeating everything. How does that make you feel? Now, I understand that in therapy, that might be really good. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. But this man had told Jesus everything that was holding him back from getting in his healing. And Jesus didn't answer one of those. I mean, Jesus didn't say a single thing. He didn't say to the man, tell me about it. Boy, that must be hard. Sometimes my sympathy holds up your healing. Okay? No, you know that, don't you? Those of you that have been through things and you're told, if you've been through treatment or anything about enabling people, sometimes I may think I am doing uh, something good, but God is saying, I don't need those five things. I don't need the pool or the man or an angel or stirred water or he doesn't need to be in the front of the line. I just want you to think this morning, what if God just removed your barriers? But they're here. What if he just said, wait a minute, child, that's not you. That's not you. I know what's happened, but that's not where you're going to live anymore. Wouldn't that be something? So, his non-response, of course, and then, and then his response. Do you, want, do you want to get well? Now, I told you in verse 8 that the man, the man, Jesus said, get up, and the man, instantly the man got well, and I won't belabor this too much, but I said it is a big deal in the Greek. And I said the translations, one says he was made well, one says he got well, and it's a middle voice in the Greek which means the man is acting upon himself also. Jesus is healing. He is part of the process of the wellness because it required a response. And the reason I know that instantly he got well, even before he felt his legs, there was nothing in there that said, and his legs got stronger, and one step at a time, and then they got the walker, and all that. That is not 
what the passage says. It says instantly he got well. A participant by saying yes. And you know why I know he believed Jesus at that moment? Because it doesn't even talk about him getting up. That's a no-brainer. He picks up his mat. He's already gone beyond that. It doesn't even say, so he got up. It just says he picked up his mat and he walked. I'm going to tell you why. Because if someone said to me, and I've been laying there 38 years, and, and you don't have much legs at that point, and someone says to me, get up, even after I've told them, I don't have a man, I don't have... And someone says to me, get up, I would kind of be going like this. Um, do you realize what you're saying? I haven't walked in 38 years. Uh, would you mind giving me a hand, whoever you are? Pull me up at least? The reason that I know is there's now no excuses once Jesus says, get up. There's no reasons. There's no explanations at all. It just says, instantly. You know what happened? He believed. He was willing to trust. You know, sometimes it's, what have I got to lose? Oh, I know. Dr. Phil doesn't say it as spiritually. But he says, how's that working for you? People stay in the same junk, laying on the same mat, yep. Yep. in the same place. I like something my friend said to me this week. I don't think Kevin Mines, very honest man. And he said something that I thought was very helpful to me. He said, I feel like, right, if I get it right, like my mat is stuck to the ground. That's what Kevin shared. There's that strong feeling that comes that says, yeah, but not, not me. And you've got to get so far past that. Your mat is not stuck to the ground. It's stuck to your thinking. Amen. It's stuck to your experience. I'm not saying your thinking has all worked. I'm saying if you have had people fail you over and over again, or you've experienced failure, you've been rejected, you've been tormented, you've been in some kind of bondage, of course... Your experience says there's no hope. We don't go by your experience. We go by the experience of the cross. Amen. It's his experience that is applied to your life. And he says all things will become new in your life. So instantly the result was a miracle. He was made well and he got well. I gave you, and I'll just give you this illustration, I gave you the illustration last week uh, of the, uh, if you were broke and I gave you a thousand dollar check, I have made you better, but you haven't gotten well till you cash the check. You, you could die broke with the cash in your pocket. You have to act on the resources. Some of the saddest stories I ever heard in my life was... Um, and you've heard them or read them in the paper. When somebody, you hear about an old person dies in their home, they find them dead. And, and it's either malnutrition. And then they find thousands of dollars in mattresses and cupboards. Or they die in heat stroke and they have all the money in the world to buy an air conditioner or have one installed. But they're paralyzed in their thinking. And they die with all the resources that they need, but they never use them. And so you need to use the resources that God gives you. That's the important thing. <clears throat> that man, that mat he was lying on, he's now throwing over his shoulders. <laughs> and he's taken off. Um, so let's look for a moment at the paths to healing. This is going to be somewhat of a review. And poor Scott today, I don't even think the PowerPoint's going to be whatever. Um, <laughs> what, did, what did the guy at District Assembly call it? Off the wall preaching. <laughs> so, so we can get by without it. But Scott does a great job with that. Okay, first of all, the renewal of your mind. In Isaiah 45, 18 and 19. He says, do not remember faith rehearse or be mindful of past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness. 
He's not saying, I will make the lake a little deeper. He is saying, I'll take a desert and make it bloom. So no matter how you describe your problem, God is bigger than any problem that you're carrying this morning. And then the next verse. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing in the Greek renovation of your mind. He wants to do a whole new thing in your mind. That's a huge part of your healing. We did the, the, these verses last week. I, Ephesians 4.23 is where we focused last week. And this is just so powerful. Be renewed in the spirit of what? Your heart? Your minds. And put on the new self. The one creating according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity. Here's what I wanted to say. It's already created. The new you has already been created. I said this last week. You have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind so you'll walk into the new wardrobe God has for you. Okay. So then we begin to move on. Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I got to tell you, I was blown away by this man, Jerry. Just seven months sobriety, he told me, he just confessed all of his sin. Told me, he says, I've got... Drinking was one of the least of my problems. He said, it's plagued me. But he said, I had lots of addictions. And, he's, and listen to what, he hasn't even accepted Christ yet, but he's gotten some material. And somebody's given him something. And he said, I said, so Jerry, what are you doing? He said, I have changed all my TV watching. You know I've said this. This is a guy who yet hasn't prayed the prayer to receive Christ. He said... I'm changing my music. I'm go And then he said, Pastor, I've got to put new things into my mind. I can't make it. My mind is really messed up. It is in bad shape. That's why I called you down here. My mind is so bad. And he said, and he started telling me, I thought this guy could teach a class on what to do after you're saved. <laughs> He's going, I'm going to do this new. Come here. Show, let, let me show you the wall over here. And I'm putting up these. And he's, he's putting up scriptures. And he doesn't. But when I asked him, do you know Christ? He said, no. He already, though, God had prepared him. And so it's like, oh. I'm going I'm to go a little bit further with this. I'm going to turn to another scripture. This may seem a little, a little bit complicated bit to pull this out of context, but the renewing of the mind, you say, well, wait a minute, but how? Well, I just told you some practical things. Of you start <clears throat> flooding your mind with things of God, flooding it until everything is washed away that isn't of God. That's the start. That's the start. But, I said last week, you have the same Holy Spirit that I do or anybody has. People say, Sam, tell me how to do it. You know what? I'm going to tell you. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is my main thing. It talks about spiritual wisdom. Now, this, this is mind-blowing, and I should spend a week on this. But I'm at least going to start. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to look at verse 6. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Okay, so first of all, he says, we speak a wisdom, but not the wisdom of this age. We don't talk like the world or think like the world, number one. But listen to this. I'm going to give you the ending right now. By the way, we have the mind of Christ comes from these passages. We possess God thoughts. Amen. That's unthinkable. Wait a minute. You can have the thoughts of God in your mind. What? Now this is in many places in Scripture, but I really want to point it out here. How does that happen? Listen to this. He says, On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, 
a wisdom God predestined for the ages for our glory. There is a wisdom. None of the other rulers knew this wisdom. And then he gives you this promise in verse 9. What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. So he's got incredible things. You can't even imagine. Your eyes can't, can't see it. Your ears cannot even hear it. It's so good. Your heart can't fathom how much good God has going for you. But then he goes on. Listen. To now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Verse 10. Holy Spirit. We're going to need to be talking about the Holy Spirit the weeks ahead. The role of the Holy Spirit. The most neglected <laughs> member of the Trinity. Since the Spirit searches everything and knows even the depths of God. And then he goes on to say, No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And we have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit who comes from God. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God knows God, knows the depths of God, and we have received the Spirit who comes from God. We speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, you have the mind of Christ available to you. The other verse in 2 Corinthians 10, we demolish arguments. I want, I want to tell you that Satan is an arguer. He loves to argue. In fact, if you give him good things, he'll say, ah, that's not true. I like that this doesn't say that we do pretty good against Satan. It doesn't say that occasionally we win a battle. It says we demolish arguments. We absolutely destroy arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And listen to this. We take every thought captive. And that word thoughts is perception of the mind. To obey Christ. You have to take thoughts that come from the enemy and you lock them away. You take them captive. And you destroy his argument. You don't keep listening to his thoughts. You demolish the argument by taking that thought captive. Yes. I'm putting it in jail. I've said that before. <clears throat> Jesus, the reason that you must change the mind, you must have your mind changed, you must call upon the Holy Spirit, and you must fill it. I have, I, listen, so many times I'm talking to people counseling. And they say, well, I, I'm just not getting the victory I, I want to have. And Okay, but I will guarantee you, if I take their allocation of their time and what they're listening to and what they're watching and what they're reading, I will understand why there's not victory. Yeah. Because a divided kingdom can't stand. It'll fall. You, have, you can't put one foot into God and say, yeah, but I did like this part of the world. <laughs> I'm sorry. That doesn't work. You're going to do the splits. Ouch. Ouch. That's what I say. My <laughs> you need, when you put a foot into the kingdom of God, you need to put both feet in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. And then you need to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. Do you see that decision part? Yeah. No, no turning, turning back. back. No turning back. Now there will be temptations. There will be things come at you. But you still have to keep your mind in the place. Because <clears throat> otherwise you'll be cast about. You'll be yeah. tossed all over the place. Unless your mind is resolute. And will there ever be episodes of Failure? Absolutely. But don't plan them. Please. I'm so sick of people saying, I can't help but sin. I'm human. Well then get spiritual. And you will be able to help but sin. Do you know what in this passage, in the rest of this chapter, John 5, he says to the man, he comes back, and he finds him in the temple and he says, stop your sinning unless something worse happens. I don't want to go into the theology of that. I'm just saying in this case, he found that man in the temple. And the first words, he said, look, you're well. 
You're well. Do you see yourself? You're well. Stop sinning. I'm going to tell you, I know that we're capable of sinning, but we ought to hate it yep. when it happens. And there's so much preaching. I read something again, Facebook the other day. I'm not different than anybody else, but I love Jesus. I still, you know, smoke and chew and swear and go with the girls and do whatever that whole thing. I, <laughs> no, you are made different in Christ if your mind is filled with new things. Now, I had a friend pass away. Can you imagine this? He was a friend I never met. Met him through ministry. We started emailing. He wrote some very good stuff. I've known him probably since about 2009 through email and text. I'm just sharing this with you because I've, I told his wife I would. So I got word that he passed away. And she was sharing grief and good going through a process and we're doing that back and forth. <clears throat> and then she said, I am so lonely. And she's in shock. It's just two, two days, three days ago that he passed away. And this may seem out of character for the message, but it really isn't. And I said, is there... Anything I can do, I'm praying for you. And all that. She says, no, I appreciate it. But then she said, I could still have him probably if he had stopped long, many years ago, the poisoning of his body. So she was saying, would you for me, if you want to do me a favor, tell them, she says, my, 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 my Mike died at 67 years old. And he had a lot of years left except the poison in his body of tobacco and alcohol. She said he could still be here if it wasn't for that. And she explained why, went into depth. Now, I'm not picking those two things and saying, I'm not being harsh. I am saying, she's saying, if there were some things he would have changed in his, when he first came to Christ and started walking differently, maybe he'd be here. That isn't so much the issue as what are you going to do. Do you want... Do you want Jesus to just <clears throat> patch in and fix a problem now and then? Oh, Jesus, I'm in trouble again. Would you please then? Or would you like him to change your patterns? Jesus didn't die on the cross to fix a problem. He died on the cross to change the whole pattern of your life and give you eternal life. I'll just give this verse. There's a lot of things that are scary about making an about face and walking out of a comfort zone. That's why Jesus said, pick up your mat and go. Don't stay in the familiar. Don't stay where God has just delivered you from. But it's scary sometimes to make big decisions of change. But here's what 2 Timothy 1.7 says. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and sound judgment. Actually, that word is mind in the original Greek. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Whatever you're afraid of this morning, that's not from God. Concern is one thing. Fear is another. God wants to remove any spirit of fear. And He wants to give you a sound mind. I have people that come to Christ and within a week they're saying, huh? I don't know. I hope I make it. No, stop. I don't know if I can make it. That spirit of fear. That's not a spirit from God. God has already done it. Are you going to turn around and put his mind in your mind? You have the mind of Christ. Isn't that something? Praise his name. We're going to pray. Um, we're going to pray today and... Um,